Welcome to Hatching Creativity. This isn't just another behavioral health podcast. This is the place where thought leaders converge to talk about real life challenges, breakthroughs, and pivotal aha moments. Just like someone who is lesbian, gay, or bisexual, you can't turn them straight. You just cannot do that. I mean, that's why we have laws against reparative therapy in the United States. But those laws, why there might be, I think now we have 29 states uh, that prohibit reparative therapy or conversion therapy, sometimes referred to as pray the gay way. I may be wrong on that number of states, but I know New Jersey was the second state to outlaw. But there's a number of states, particularly in the Midwest or the Bible Belt, where young people are being sent to these camps. And they're being forced to modify their behavior, restrict their behavior as if they could become heterosexual. And it doesn't happen. It, 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 there is no evidence that shows reparative or conversion therapy can be successful. It has been spoken out against by the American Psychiatric Association, American Psych, um, Psychiatric Psychology, uh, Pediatrics, Social Work, Addiction Counselors. We all have statements against reparative therapy, and yet there are still individuals who try to offer it. In New Jersey, it's considered unethical, and actually, it's um, you could be... So, you know, I don't want to talk about just in our state, because I am very proud of our state that our attorney general took it very serious and said, if you are offering that to someone, you're committing consumer fraud. Not only is it harmful to them, but it's also fraud. And that's why we put a stop to the practice here in New Jersey. You know, there's so many little things that are happening. And what we're seeing now is as we made progress for a number of years, the previous administration pushed us back. And we are now dealing with the implications of that pushback. I just use, you know, some other examples. There's there have been protests and and harassments and people have found their voice and empowered themselves. You know, 1959 was the first known uh, activity where someone said to the to the police officers who were harassing them, stop, it's not right. You know, we didn't do anything wrong. Here it's the Cooper's Donut, which is a donut shop in LA. They were inside the donut shop having coffee and, and chit chatting, like a lot of people do after a night on the town. And the police came in typically to harass them, particularly if they were trans or drag queens or commercial, you know, certified sex. I'm sorry, not certified sex workers. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> commercial sex workers, you know, engaging in prostitution. Yes, that might have been uh, illegal activity. But they weren't doing it in the coffee shop. They were just having a cup of coffee and talking with their friends. What I would like to do is talking a little bit about solution. Let's talk a little bit about first, if you feel that you're being harassed or being treated unfairly, what can somebody do in order to to speak up? Mike, you know, I just want to make an observation here also, because, yes, why it is important for LGBT individuals to find their voice and to feel in power. That also goes back, it kind of has its roots to what we refer to as victim blaming, that if you're the one being abused and you're the one that has to correct the situation, well, what about the rest of society? And that's where allies are so important. Allies 100%. are the ones that stand up and say, wait a minute, I don't know what you're basing that information on, but it's inaccurate. I know many LGBT clients. I know many LGBT counselors. And that's not what they do or that's not what they need. So again, yes, gay people should feel empowered, should be able to address and confront homophobia and transphobia and other biphobia that exists. But at the same time, we as a community also, and there are many people, I think that's what we're dealing with in our in our political strife right now, as much as there has been a pushback, and it feels like sometimes with all these increase in anti-LGBT legislation, particularly, uh, you know, women in sports is what they're referring to it as, but it's really, it's really an anti-trans bill. And it's, it's showing up in many different areas. I think that there are many people who say, wait a minute, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's really necessary. You know, I don't think it's going to hurt someone if there's a transgender person on the team. And I also know that, you know, there's a right to privacy when you're using a restroom or a changing room or a bathroom facility. So why are we all of a sudden threatened by someone who might be perceived as being another gender coming into a restaurant? I mean, if they're there for illegal activities, of course, that's illegal. But just to go in to use a restaurant, I mean, I'm sorry, a restroom, you know, should not be challenged because of how someone appears to be and someone else thinks they might be trans or expressing their gender differently. But I think, Mike, going back to back to the idea behind this, 
That's why allies are so important. And I believe that the better we educate allies, then we'll have those clinicians or we'll have those family members or friends who say, hey, wait a minute, I don't think that's true. Or we can stop that, you know, stop repeating a distortion, stop believing a lie. We can do better. I think that goes back to the treatment communities when we say we need to do better and we can do better and we do have resources available to help people do better. So you know what I think is also really important? You talk about allies. And I think and I agree with you. The allies speaking up is even more important, but also the allies being cognizant of the message that they want to be sharing. Oftentimes when people run out of facts without, you know, when you run out of facts, or maybe when you're arguing with somebody who has no argument based in the facts, right? You know, there's an expression. uh, I don't know if if you're familiar with Sam Harris, um, but Sam Harris had an expression and he says, you know, if somebody doesn't value evidence, you're never going to give them enough evidence to make them value it. And I think that's really important because coming from an ally's perspective, as soon as it devolves into name calling, arguing, anything outside of facts, it works against what you're trying to do. In fact, you just you you're you're worsening the situation. And I'm not saying to be tolerant of ignorance because there's no tolerance. There should be no tolerance for ignorance. It should be about trying to educate the ignorant and be able to provide good facts that are going to back what your argument is, as opposed to getting into those kinds of arguments that are just uh, about the other person rather than the facts. Does that make sense? You know, there unfortunately are some individuals who are comfortable in their ignorance, which is really unfortunate because, again, as much as uh, the work that I'm doing is important, the, the contributions that you are making are important, it also has to be a change that occurs, not just with the individual, not just in their immediate family, but also in their community, but also in society in general. And each of us can make that change. In public health, we talk about the social ecological model, which is how we do bring about change. So Mm -hmm. not only do we need the belief and the change in the belief systems that are out there that are anti or harassing or discriminating or bullying or stigmatizing or creating prejudice against LGBT individuals, we also need to make a change that we have laws of protection. And many of those laws of protection have been written but at the same time, they're often ignored or they're trying, or people are attempting to rewrite them to exclude LGBT individuals. Uh, Mike, if I can just for a moment, go back and remind people that, you know, we've seen laws and policy change and then we're seeing a pushback. You know, uh, President Obama repealed the Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which uh, uh, allowed military personnel to be open in their transitioning or in their coming out. And then we had another administration where they denied it. And then we're back to now President Biden has again reversed the ban on transgender people in the military, which went into effect in January 21. So this political strife that we're seeing, why you don't have to be a service member to recognize that it's creating an undercurrent around our country. So there are a lot of resources available. I encourage people to check out nowgap.org, N-A-L-G-A-P.org. That's our website. We have a lot of resources on there that can help individuals. The important thing going back to the treatment community is many times in treatment, gay people have been treated only with a minimum level of tolerance, sometimes not even help to feel welcome. But we need to move from that unwelcoming environment to a welcoming environment, to an environment that's also affirmative. And I think that's what we'll be talking about next time, Mike, how Mm -hmm. the spectrum of treatment that we can offer to people needs not to just to recognize LGBT individuals, but to help to affirm them in their identity, in their gender expression, and also within their community, because that's where it does come back to the whole community. You know, recovery for me is about connection. Mm -hmm. Addiction was about isolation. So it's really important. And I've seen, unfortunately, people going into treatment who were LGBT identified and told, don't worry about that right now. Just focus on your alcohol and drug use and that other stuff will get sorted out later. 
No, it, it's the issue they're coming in with. And if we can connect them to a community that yeah. supports their recovery, an LGBT affirmative community, it's going to be really important. And yet many clinicians aren't really sure how or when to do that. So I would love to carry the conversation with you, Mike, in our future, where we can move yeah. into some of those components. Well, Phil, thank you so much for coming on today. I, I appreciate your time and and everything you put together. This is really good. Um, maybe we can share this slideshow. If you're okay with sending it to me, I'd be happy to link it onto uh, onto the the podcast. And yeah, guys, uh, I, I can't wait to to bring Phil back on and talk a little bit more about um, the treatment world and the uh, and the center of excellence, the things we're doing together. Phil, thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, I look forward to the next one. All right. Thank you, Mike. Happy to be here, and thank you, everybody who's listening. Thanks so much, Phil. Thanks for tuning in to Hatching Creativity. We appreciate your support. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and tell all your friends about the show. And remember, it's never just about one thing. One thing.